Women did not. Men took care of the family financially. If a man was killed on the job in a large company, the company then became responsible for the entire family. Russell Majors and Waddell just didn't want to have to deal with that, so they wanted unattached men. Why did they have to be skinny? Well, because for a horse to run at 10 miles an hour, it had to have as little weight on its possible, on its back as possible. Okay? So they figured these young kids, probably 18 to 20 average, only the youngest one was, how old are you, son? Uh, seven. Seven, how old are you? Eight. Eight. The youngest rider was 11. Mm -hmm. Not much older than you. Now, can some of you folks, parents, grandparents, can you imagine letting your 11-year-old ride out all by himself in the middle of Paiute territory? Yeah. Oldest one was <laughs> Now, I 
was known as one of the most skilled and bravest riders of all the Pony Express. Now, when my family moved out from Marion, Alabama, when my father was hired to be the editor of the Sacramento Union, I learned to rope and ride from the local vicarons, and I soon surpassed their skills. I became an excellent horseman and an outdoorsman, so I was, I was perfect for the job. So when Bolivar Roberts hired me, he assigned me to the most treacherous part of the trail, and my westernmost home station was Sportsman's Hall at Pollock Pines, California. My, my easternmost home station initially was right here in Genoa, Nevada Territory. Now, my very first ride happened on April 4th of 1860. I took the mail from good old Sam Hamilton up there at Sportsman's Hall and headed off up towards Johnson Pass. By the time I hit Strawberry Station, I was in a blinding snowstorm. Again, this was April 4th. This is the Sierras. We all know what can happen. It was necessary to guide me to the top of Johnson Pass so that I could then travel down the two miles of Holly Gray to Lake Valley. I then proceeded up over Luther Pass, through Grass Lake, through the Aspens, down into Hope Valley, Pickett's Junction, down into Woodford's, and then on into Genoa, where I rested over until the mail was coming back from the east going westbound. So, my first ride going west was April 13th, and I found myself at the base of Holly Grade at midnight in a blinding snowstorm. <laughs> I had to work my way up this grade, and about halfway up, I encountered a pack of mules with everything unloaded from the back of the packs around them in the snow. Snow was belly high to each mule. I had to get off my horse and drape the snow around each mule so that we could get past. By the time I got to the top of Holly Grade, I could see an encampment of men and I knew what had happened. I couldn't stop to talk to them. I had to get to Sportsman's Hall because the mail was now late. It took me three hours to get up Holly Grade. Got into Sportsman's Hall late. Sam Hamilton was late getting to Sacramento, so the mail could not go on the, the paddle wheel boat, the Antelope. So it had to be ridden in through Martinez and Venetia. So when you visit those towns, that's why there's Pony Express markers. Do you know what? We made it in 10 days. We accomplished what we set out to do. It arrived east, it arrived back in St. Joseph in 10 days, and it arrived in Sacramento in 10 days, so we were successful. Now, I may be the bravest and the most skilled rider in the entire Pony Express, <laughs> The most famous rider with the fastest time ever was my friend, Robert Pony Bob Haslam. Now, Pony Bob Haslam was about a 20-year-old British gentleman who came out here, out west, and helped to build the Pony Express Trail. Now, when the Pony Express started on April 3rd of 1860, they had not yet finished Henry Van Sickle's Kingsbury Toll Road. It took about six weeks into the endeavor. When it was finished, they stationed Pony Bob Haslam at Friday Station on the lake side of the road. My easternmost home station then became Friday Station. And it was Pony Bob that came down through here and on out to Fort Churchill. So he only had to ride at 75 miles. He had to go through the Sierras a bit, but he had it easy. He was thinking that he had it made. He soon realized something quite different, you see. One of his first trips out east, he got into Carson City. It was along about May of, eight, of uh, 1860, May 12th or so. Gets into Carson City to change horses, and there ain't no horses to change. Nobody around town neither. Seemed kind of strange. So went on to Dayton, same thing happened, and headed on out towards Fort Churchill. Well, by the time he got to Fort Churchill, he found out what had happened. You see, just a few days earlier, out at, out at Smith Station, where probably you'd know La Haunton at this time, these scoundrels by the name of Smith, these brothers, were known for cheating and card sharpening and also um, not being too polite to the ladies. What had happened is they had kidnapped some Paiute women, held them hostage, and had their way with them. 
The Paiutes got quite upset, as you can imagine, and started up a ruckus. Well, one of the, one of the gentlemen from Smith Creek Station who hadn't been there when, every, when the uh, Paiutes came in and, and tore up the station started heading back towards town, hollering that the Paiutes were coming to kill them. There was 10 of them. Next station, he said, well, there was 50. The next time he got into town, there was 100. So you get the impression that by Carson City, those Paiutes had, had multiplied quite a bit. So everybody took up arms, and they were going to go teach those Paiutes a lesson. So when Pony Bob Haslam got into Buckland Station and realized what had happened, the next rider who was supposed to take over would not go. He was too feared to go. It was chicken liver. Now, Pony Bob knew that he signed up for a job and he was going to do his job, so he offered to take that rider's next leg of the journey. And they paid him $50 to do it. Well, he went all the way to Smith Creek Station without incident. But when he headed back after nine hours with a westbound mail, he encountered at Clear Creek Station a massacre. While the station was burned, the horses was run off, and the station master was killed. And Pony Bob knew that what he had heard was now true. And he, sent, he went back through every single station sounding the alarm. He convinced station masters and attendants to abandon the stations and head back to Carson City. By the time that he reached Friday Station, he had ridden 300 and 80 miles, one single rider, the longest ride in the entire Pony Express for one rider. And he was credited with saving many lives. He was also known as the fastest rider in the Pony Express. Long about March of 1861, got a new president, didn't he? And he gave an inaugural address, President Lincoln's inaugural address. Well, we didn't have no radios, televisions, or computers to, to let us hear that, did we? How were, out west were they going to find out what old President Lincoln had to say? Pony Express to the rescue. They added a few other horses and a few other riders and, and sent that inaugural address off from St. Joseph, Missouri, lickety split. I'm proud to say that I was one of those riders. And we accomplished that ride, the fastest ride in the entire company, in seven days and 17 hours. Pony Bob Haslam, however, completed that ride 120 miles in eight hours and 20 minutes. Oh, wounded. You see, he'd been shot by a Paiutes. He had a broken jaw with an arrow sticking out of his jaw and an arrow sticking out of his arm. He didn't stop to tend to it until he had passed that mochila to the next ride. Now, we weren't the only two famous riders in this area. No, we had some pretty famous relief riders, too. Now, remember I mentioned the youngest rider was 11 years old? Bronco Charlie Miller out of Woodfords, California. Now, old Bronco Charlie Miller came out to, from New York with his brother, just like you two, are your brothers or cousins? Your friends, cousins, okay. Well, they, actually, they was real bad boys back in New York, and, and their family wanted to teach them a lesson. I guess back in those days, in the 1860s, they had certain ways of dealing with naughty children. <laughs> and they put the two kids on a ship to be ship hands for about a year or two until they could get straightened out. Well, about the time that the ship got in San Francisco, both, both Henry and Charlie jumped ship. Well, eventually they rounded up Henry, but they never got a hold of Charlie, and Charlie ended up living and working on a farm on a ranchero in California, IA, and he learned to be an excellent rider and roper, such as myself. And, when the word went out, he became a Pony Express rider, and he, he uh, worked for, sev for several months on some very dangerous and important runs. Now also, he lived a very colorful life. While well, in later years, he ended up working for Buffalo Bill Cody in his Wild West shape. Buffalo Bill Cody was a rider too when he was about 16 for a couple months till his mama got sick. But he always had that love for the Pony Express and wanted to share that history with everybody. And he recognized the spirit in Charlie and hired him. But Charlie was a colorful character, told tall tales, but for the most part, I think I told you the right story. 
find out anything different, let me know. <laughs> in town here, we had a 16-year-old who was a nephew of one of the founders of this town. Stephen Kinsey was a founder of this town along with Colonel John Reese and his house is next door to, to uh, Mormon Station there. Well, his nephew, Theodore Perry Hawkins, was a rider in his young days. He was a relief rider between here in Dayton and here in Lake Tahoe. He later went on to marry, have about nine children, become a prominent citizen of Genoa, and for the remainder of his years, owned the Dake House down there where the Genoa Mavericks are shooting it up this weekend. Okay? So we had some very colorful riders here in Sierra Nevada, and I'm proud to be one of them. Well, all good things come to an end, and along of what began on April 3rd of 1860, ended unceremoniously on October 24th of 1861. Now for something that was lasting such a short time, folks sure have a fond sense of memory about it. Now a hundred years later, Waddell Smith, great-grandson of William Waddell, started the, or founded, the National Pony Express Centennial Association Celebration. 100 riders, excuse me, 1,000 riders, took a lot more than that, 1,000 riders rode a reenactment between St. Joseph, Missouri and Sacramento, California. What began as a celebration turned into the National Pony Express Association in 1978. A few old gentlemen were sitting around a table and they decided that the history of the Pony Express was being lost. And they wanted to, to reestablish, identify, and rewrite the National Pony Express Trail. So they set up a system of how to restore the trail again, to identify it, to do annual rewrites, something similar to what Waddell Smith had done. And they were famous for many things. I mean, I'm sure many of you have seen the rewrite come through town. But they were famous for other things, too. As a matter of fact, they made history in March and April of 1983. Uh, American River Canyon, over along Highway 50 going from Tahoe down to Placerville. April, along about April 12th or so, a tremendous avalanche came down the side of the hill because there had been a fire the year before, there were tremendous rains that year. An avalanche came down the side of the hill, crossed Highway 50, and dammed up, nearly dammed up the American River. Folks, it was so deep, that, that pile of debris, that they actually did not know if anybody had been trapped in it. They had to search it to make sure. Nobody was trapped, no cars were trapped, nobody was hurt. But the result was, is that it was completely blocked off from Kybers to Little Norway. And the detour to get up there was 115 miles. So some Pony Express member who was sitting, uh, who had uh, originally been up there at, at Sportsman's Hall, or Upson's home station, and came up with the idea as the Pony Express, he was talking to the postmaster. I think they kind of were joking, but they said, hey, you know, the Pony Express could get it through. They wouldn't let a little avalanche stop them. And then a light bulb went on because the actual historic trail was above the avalanche. So the call went out, and about 62 riders answered the call, both from Nevada and from California. And 62 gentlemen started on April 15th. What day is that? So you know what they were carrying and what they were carrying. And they started uh, carrying the mail back and forth um, starting at 8 a.m. six days a week. Now, the government, the U.S. Postal Service said, well, you got to sign a contract and we got to pay you. Well, we're the National Pony Express Association, volunteer organization, nonprofit. We don't get paid. We, we don't take, you know, take money. He said, no, there's got to be a nominal fee paid. So they put down $2 a day. Mm. So they got paid $2 a day. So for the next six weeks, they carried 60,000 pieces of mail. Mm. And they got it through. <coughs> now, 
What's the result of this? We have a contract with the United States Postal Service. We didn't back in 1860. We were private. We were a private organization. Today, there are three entities that legally can carry the U.S. mail: the United States Postal Service, the Coast Guard, the National Pony Express Association. <coughs> We also have a re-ride every year. Um, if you guys are local residents here or, or from uh, Lake Tahoe or down the line of Carson, Dayton, you see us come through along about June. This is the 150th, 154th uh, ride. It's going to enter Woodford's this year. It goes west to east. They kind of switch off each year. And it's going to enter um, Nevada about 9 a.m. on Wednesday, no, on Thursday, April 12th. June 12th. June, yeah, thank you. I get confused. Yeah. And I'm a writer. Yeah. It's going to come through June 12th. And it's going to come through Genoa. Um, it's going to get here about 11 o'clock, and there's going to be a big celebration, Mormon Station. And it's, it's a 150th signature event, just like this is, just like the Cowboy Festival is. And it's going to get through Nevada probably on the 14th of June. Um, and enter into Ivapah, Utah. So if you're anywhere along the way, it's a lot of fun to see. Now, along about 1990, uh, the Pony Express made history once again. <laughs> Women were allowed to ride for the first time, believe it or not. And Nevada, the state of Nevada, out of all eight states, we had the first woman president of the National Pony Express Association. And my name is Kim Copel, and I'm the secretary of the National Pony, uh, Nevada Division of the National Pony Express Association. And there are lots of ways that you can find out about our organization. We have a booth there today in uh, Mormon Station State Park, and I believe it's being manned by one of our national vice presidents and his wife. His wife is a descendant of Alexander Majors, so they keep it in the family. Uh, XPHomestation.com, XP, that's our trail marker. HomeStation.com is how you can find out what the National Pony Express Association is doing. There's still time, folks, and you can get one for me today. You can send a letter by Pony Express if you didn't know that. Just fill out a form. I think you pay something like five dollars, mail it in, and, they, and you will your your letter. It's a vignette. It's already set up for you. It'll represent a station in California this year, but it will go into the mochila pouch. And folks, I didn't explain when I was worn off up, some, but this is a present day mochila. The other ones were very small. This is present day. This is designed to go on a western saddle, and this, this will carry all the mail. But it will go in to the uh, cantinas in California, be locked, and be taken out in St. Joseph, Missouri, and given a special stamp that it traveled by Pony Express, okay? So you can just take, you know, take one of these and mail it in on your own. Um, I also have membership forms. If you want, if you want to become a writer, you can join any time. You don't have to be a writer. You can be interested in promoting the history of the events. So that's that's kind of what we're all about. And our history really is right here in Genoa and, and part of the beginnings of Nevada Territory. Okay. Now I want to see how well everybody was listening because I have three questions for you, and you can get a CD for a Nevada um, Territory Pony Express Territory CD. Not an easy question. What uh, what ended? And I may not have said this, so if I did, I'll not completed my sentence. Yeah. Uh, what what I mean, you guys may know anyway. What actually was the final thing that ended the Pony Express? The telegram. The telegram. Telegram. Absolutely. You know, and the most popular misconception is that was the. Um, Railroad. Transcontinental Railroad, which came in 1869, probably the word transcontinental is in there. And actually, when the Pony Express was running, we had the telegraph coming through Genoa and out to uh, Carson City. It was uh, it was General B's grapevine uh, uh, line. So that so the um, telegraph was being built at the same time the Pony Express was running. So the Pony Express was never meant to be a permanent thing. Okay, it was meant to be a band-aid, just so you guys know that. So, you know, we riders ended up working for Wells Fargo or, or joining the Civil War, uh, fighting for the North or the South. So we just knew it was a temporary thing. So next question, what were the three entities that are now allowed to carry the U.S. mail? The gentleman in the back has hand up first. I'm sorry. Um, Coast Guard, Pony Express, U.S. mail. 
You got it. The national Let's get it back, point is get it backwards. <laughs> no, no, no. All three. It doesn't matter. Whoever needs us. But the point is, is that if we, if it was something was needed today, where they literally needed the horses to get the mail through somewhere, they could call on us, and we have a standing contract. Okay. Now this is a little bit more difficult because I didn't actually tell you the answer, but I want to see if you guys were thinking about it. How did we help? Uh, save the Union. How do you think it was that we actually helped save the Union? I gave you the answer, but I didn't give it to you pointedly. Yes, sir. Uh, the silver paid for the balancing the budget, sort of. Well, yes, but how did the Pony Express, what was their role in saving the Union? Backs. <laughs> just Backs. Getting it talking across. Yeah, just it, with the speed of, of getting the mail up. Here. Do another one. Yeah, we're the same family. We're, we're the oh, same family. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you're being the gentleman. <laughs> you get it for the silver. <laughs> now, folks, you're not going to get out of here easy, okay? Because you know just about as much as I know now about the Pony Express, and you never know. One of these days, they may need to um, to start the whole thing up again, and we may need lots of riders, okay? <laughs> so I want you all to raise your right hand. Because you're going to take the original oath that Warren Upson took in April of 1860. Hey, raise your right hand. Don't be afraid. I see you. Okay. Uh, repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. By the great and living God. By the great and living God. That during my engagement. During my engagement, and while I am an employee, and while I am an employee of Russell Majors and Waddell, of Russell Majors and Waddell, I will under no circumstances use profane language. <laughs> <laughs> we lost like some people. <laughs> Sheila found, that is for sure, and had mail spread all around it. Well, the Paiutes or the Shoshone or whoever w was on, on that trail there, think of this. These brave riders were protecting this with their lives. 
So they wondered what was so important in those bags that these men who they respected would protect this. When they got a hold of it, it was nothing but letters. It wasn't <laughs> something that was valuable to them, so they just left it. And I think the mochila was found like almost a year later. Mm -hmm. So we know that the mochila, you know, one was lost for a while, and then about three riders were outright killed. There, uh, did I answer your question? Yes. Got going. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Are you all enjoying the, uh, oh, you, sir, yes. Uh, we're from the Truckee area. Uh, there's a, attached to Morris Valley, there's a, uh, a ranch called the Waddell Ranch. Do you know if, you know if there's I don't know if there's any connection, but it would be very interesting if it was. The, the, um, I believe the Waddell family did come out west. I know that the majors stayed back east, and it very well could be a descendant, because I think William Waddell ended up here somewhere, because he, beca they kind of, uh, he became kind of connected with Bill Hera, and that's why up at Harris, there's the big statue. Is the national is Bill Hera? Uh, the story gets backwards, and I heard it for years the wrong way. But uh, that Bill Hera set set the statue up. But the Pony Express gave the statue to Bill Hera for his um, promotion of the history of the Pony Express. It used to sit at the base of Kingsbury Grave because grave, there was a park there, and now it's in front of Harris. So probably poor Bill is just rolling in his grave. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so yeah, um, I, they're very. You, you got me thinking. There very well could be some kind of connection. So well, if there aren't any more questions, uh, oh you sir. At the end of the eighteen months, did the company make a profit or what? That's a good question. If we have a couple more minutes, do we have a couple more minutes? Okay. Do. I, I, I don't go into this, but there's, this is a tremendous story. Um, this thing was set up to fail from the beginning. Um, Russell Majors, why that? Russell got him into trouble. Russell, in his big mouth, he was the promoter. And when this came up, he says, oh, we can do it. We can do the horses. I figured it out. Majors and Waddell said, you know, no, no, no. We can't afford this. This is a no-win situation. They wanted the freighting contract from the Army when the war started. So after Russell opened his big mouth and got him, they all backed each other up because that's what they did. They were very honest men. And they said, OK, we'll go with this. We know we won't make money. But because we're doing this, there was like a handshake that, yeah, we'll give you the Army freighting contract because they were freighters. Never happened. They went bankrupt. Even Russell. Um, uh, uh, Alec, uh, Russ, 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 was arrested like on New Year's Eve in 1861, Christmas Eve, 1861, because he had absconded with some funds. I mean, it just it, it, all three men went completely bankrupt. But however, earlier on um, in 1861, kind of about May, uh, May or July, and this is where it gets. It, uh, wake up, dude. <laughs> 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 so this, I am long winded. About May or so after the bankruptcy was just, you know, was going through, and this is where it gets kind of convoluted, um, uh, Stagecoach uh, stage and Freighting, oh, I'm losing his name because I know his name really well, too. Well, anyway, somebody else kind of owned the contract. He took it back. And he, he took back the, the loan or whatever it was. And then he <coughs> sold it to Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo bought it from him. And I forgot the guy's name. It'll come to me after you all leave the room. So that is why many of us associate um, uh, the Pony Express with Wells Fargo, because Wells Fargo ended up with it in the end. Mm. And then when the Telegraph was going to join October 24th, Wells Fargo just shut that end down. But they still operated some offshoots until the, they could get the Telegraph spread out. Pony Bob Haslam went on to, for several years, ran from Reno to Virginia City, and he also did a stint um, from Virginia City up to the lake as a Pony Express rider, mm -hmm. still for Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. And so you'll read uh, along about 1864 or so, there's a famous race between Pony Bob and a stagecoach going, or no, excuse me, another rider for another, um, for, for Pacific um, Express Company yeah. from Reno up to there. So he did work for Wells Fargo as a, me a messenger. And then Pony Bob ended up, you know, um, doing several different things, and he died an older man at, in uh, Chicago, Illinois, he's working for a hotel in Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. But to the end of his days, he would pass out cards um, saying that, you know, he had been a Pony Express rider. Mm -hmm. So I hope I answered that. Yes. Now, um, you guys don't even have to get up and get out of your seats, because the next person coming in um, can give you a lot of history about the pipe. So if you guys want to stick around and meet Sarah Winnemucca, <coughs> 
I think that would be a very good uh, good use of your time. So I thank you for your uh, Hi, I'm Michael Smith. I'm here at the shop talking with, with Liz. You created this beautiful event. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, what can you say about what you've done here? Well, we've basically gathered all of our holistic vendors. We've got all kinds of energetic healing and uh, all jewelry and Reiki and massage. And we've all come together just, just to spread the love because that's what we do. Well, you have a beautiful booth. How many people are participating in this event? Um, I have 40 vendors here today. We've got the workshop area back there that's full of people taking part in the free interactive workshops. Well, my sister's here. Uh, she's looking for a job. I'm, I have her down there with the job people. Perfect. And Sandy Lene, my psychic friend's here. And uh, Doug Cooper, my uh, pain cream and skin cream guy's here. And Colleen Holden's here. She has uh, beautiful clothes. So you just attract businesses and people of the, what do you call it, the healing arts? Yes. The and healing arts. I am so thankful for what you do. Thank you. Because that's all, it's all karma. Yes. And are you doing this every year? This is a yearly thing. Um, actually, yeah, we're on our fourth one. And we've been having, we had so much success, we have to do two a year. Excellent. So, yeah, this is our first one this year, and we'll do another one in the fall. So, we're so if you happen to miss an event, come on down in the fall. But look for it. Right. What's the exact name again? It's called the Festival of Earthly Treasures and Healing Arts. And we're on our fourth one. And if you want to get in, all of these people were, as, are accessible through the Goddess Shop. It's my shop. It's on uh, 112 East John Street. You can come on by. We do uh, workshops. Where people showcase what they do and how beautiful they are. And oh, oh, there's Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> and if you uh, want to get a booth, do you have a phone number for them? Yes, I do. Phone number for booth or any information uh, is 775-443-0655. And this, this place we're at now is called the Carson... Um... This is the Carson City Community Center. And I should mention that um, we got a shop and this is also a fundraiser for uh, Esperanza Foundation. And we are dedicated to facilitating the healing of post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, with specialized programs with veterans and domestic violence. Well, I tell you, anything helping veterans is a big deal, and oh, I do yeah. appreciate it. It's the American spirit to, to pay back to our veterans how yeah. much they, they, they we were lucky to live like this. Right, and not just our veterans; it's the whole family. Well, I, I and agree. And all of us. You know, yeah. Heal everybody. Well, thank you very much, and I look forward to meeting more of your people. All right. Thank you so much for being here, Michael. You're welcome, Michael Smith. I'm with uh, Julie. <laughs> yes. Now, tell me what we got going here today. Well, we have some interactive. Garden therapy for you. Excellent. We have some chard, kale, peppers, and lettuce. Everyone comes and gets a little bit of help to go in a cup. And these are therapy plants, so they were grown by our mental health uh, program in San Francisco County, where they use they get the homeless and give them a sense of purpose. And they grow veggies as part of their therapy program and sell them back to the public. So here's a little variety of vegetables that people can take home and plant. And you may be asking why I'm wearing this permaculture design crown. I think it's beautiful. Thank you. Well, it demonstrates all the components of natural gardening, integrating um, the beneficial insects and birds and butterflies to your garden to help take care of the pest management problems and also beautify your garden and your garden therapy experience. Well, thank you very much. You're I do welcome. appreciate it. It sounds like a very good cause. Happy gardening. And I look forward to talking to you more about this in the future. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, I'm Michael Smith. I'm here at a festival special What's Works Coaching. And yes. this beautiful young lady is going to teach me about how I can help my job career. Yes. So this is What Works Coaching. And we offer business, life, mindset, and career coaching. Um, this business is founded by Diane Dye Hansen, 
she of course has her website, whatworkscoaching.com. Of course, she's also on Facebook and you can like her there. Um, also, Diane does um, an article every week with carsonnow.org. Excellent. So you can see that every Monday on the website um, with, of course, tips for um, your job and even personal issues, anything that you're working on, any area that you may be stuck in. And she can help you work through those things with um, made, uh, setting goals and well, then achieving those goals. Well, I know a lot of people, when the downturn happened, they had to take a, a lower level job for survival. Yeah. And now the economy seems to be picking up and it's time to get back to the level they're used to being. So is this the kind of person I come to see to get me back in the market? Because I might not have really been paying attention the last three or four years because I've been surviving. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So the economy is taking a turn. We're so thankful for that. So it's a great time for people to begin, you know, working towards their their life goals and what their dreams and aspirations are. And of course, Diane does this as well. Well, actually, my beautiful sister just moved here from Wisconsin and not knowing the market also puts her at a disadvantage and she's a recent college graduate and that would be a perfect person to help that's new to the area too. Yes, yes, of course. Third area, there's a lot of retired people that come here just to kind of relax and then they find they get bored. Can you like help them get something to do? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, definitely looking at what you're passionate, you know, where your heart really lies, where your joy comes from and then pursuing that, following that and finding a way to make that, you know, your source of income. Exactly. Well, again, your contact information, please. Um, well, of course, Carson, uh, or whatworkscoaching.com. Okay, and there's yeah. your phone number? Uh, 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 let's see. I lost my internet myself. Yes, so I do have a number here for Diane. It's 775-391-5015. And is your office local here? Yes, definitely local Carson office. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, and, and I look forward to having you uh, talk to you more about helping people get jobs. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So, Robin, she's with Car Carson City Pottery, and she's a very nice person and uh, with a lot of different activities going here. Tell me what you got going. Well, right here today I have pottery for sale, and I've got little dishes, and I've got potion and lotion jars and containers. They're so small. Uh, yeah, these are great also for the little Harry Potter wizard in your family because oh. they can make up their own little potions. And these are all food safe, so you can put anything you'd like in them. Excellent. Oils, or you can use them for little weed pots when your little ones bring you little flowers from the garden. So there's a tons of uses for them. Well, my wife does a lot of aromatherapy things. That'd be a nice little jar to put her things in. Yes, her... and that's, that's another reason why they're all food safe. Yeah. Because you never know what they're going to be used for. And I saw that your husband's also here, too. My husband is here, and he's got these wonderful teapots. Those are teapots? These are teapots. Oh, well, they're so this beautiful. This is a vase, um, but those are teapots. Oh, and wow. My wife uh, loves tea. This, this might be an expensive stop for me. It might be. And then I have my fertility goddesses, which I absolutely love making. Excellent. And they're just to bring fertility into your life. You can see I like doing a lot of hand carving. So if you need fertility, you come by and pick up a, a fertility mug? Any kind of fertility in your life. And so did I hear you say that you uh, have your wares at the Carson um, Museum or Children's Museum? I'm located, uh, Carson City Pottery is located inside the Children's Museum. It's a beautiful place. I love that place. It's a wonderful place and they've been doing a lot of work to it and drawing more people and lots more kids activities. And there I teach classes to children 12 and up, but mostly to adults. Okay, um, and we have a lot of evening classes. The hours change. Like us on Facebook and you'll get our notifications. Now, I'm also involved with the Empty Bowls Foundation. Yes, could you expand on that, please? Yes, Empty Bowls is a nationwide grassroots movement that was started in the 1990s by a few potters. The premise is simple. Artists donate bowls, the restaurants donate food, and the public makes a minimum donation. This year it's only $10, as it was last, our first year. Uh, and for that $10, you choose a bowl, have it filled with food, and then take the bowl home with you to remind you of all the empty bowls in your community. 
all proceeds for this Carson City event go to Fish's Food Program because they feed people in four counties and do a phenomenal job of keeping the hungry fed. And it's really important to spread hunger awareness. And so we have some free bowl making events coming up where we invite the public to come in and make bowls with us to donate for the event to help raise money in the community. It sounds like you have a lot of, a lot of things that you take care of, a lot of people. Again, could you, what's your contact information? My contact information, uh, I am on Facebook, Carson City Pottery. Also, there's a Facebook, Empty Bowls, Carson City, no, Empty Bowls, Carson City Facebook page. There's also now CarsonCityEmptyBowls.com and CarsonCityPottery.com, which is brand new, and I don't know how soon there's going to be content available Can I have a Joanne Hill? Hill? A on that. Right, please? A Joanne um, Hill. And just a very strong, heavy presence on Facebook. You can reach me directly at 775 775- 313-8628 and the Empty Bowls Project is always looking for volunteers. Excellent. Well, I tell you, your, your craft is very beautiful. Thank you very and you, much, And you make these all yourself? Yes, they're all handmade. And if I wanted to learn how to do this, I could come and take your classes? Yes, I have classes. We keep them very small. Uh, I try to cap them at five people. So you can jump in at any time and get started, and I can work with everybody individually. I give people the basics, and then we go whatever direction you want to go into, that's where we go. Well, I, I peeked at your, uh, your your guide, and somebody was having way too much fun as uh, spinning the, the play. And maybe you want to have, want to have fun, too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. I enjoy the wheel. My husband doesn't like the wheel, so... You don't need to, to make beautiful pieces. And did you say his pieces are at uh, Bridger Mountain? No, his oh. pieces currently, he only is at uh, Artsy Fartsy Art Gallery. Oh, okay. And he actually has one piece at the Artist Co-op in Reno. Okay, they're but very interesting. We have a very a beautiful representation of our work at Artsy Fartsy. Well, it sounds good. I really like your, uh, your items, too, here. Thank you very much. For These chilling. are slabs. Well, These are the deadly foxtails. Oh, could you tell me about that? Um, they're just so beautiful, but they're so dangerous. You get it into your pet's fur, and it could kill them. Oh, wow. But I pressed it into the clay, and that's where the glaze is. So you can see there's no glaze except for right here. And I just I love doing things like that, working with vegetation and having fun. So I'm not always on the wheel. Well, thank you for explaining that. I was getting curious, and I didn't know what the hell to ask about that. Well, otherwise, it's uh, Michael Smith reporting from the Carson City Pottery location. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. Have a blessed day. See you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Michael Smith. I'm with uh, Doug. And what you got going here? Well, we probably have the, the best paint creams you'll find anywhere in the world. Right here. It's non-greasy. No no heat, no cold, no smell. And it lasts for 24 hours. Wrinkle cream. This is amazing. It's the only wrinkle cream that's guaranteed for 30 days. You'll see a difference within the first 30 minutes. We also have a hand and body cream. Second to none. This is great for nurses because you can put it on once a day, twice at the very most. And your hands will be safe, crack, and you can have all the pain and everything from, from uh, things on thumbnails or fingernails, things like that. Then we also have psoriasis and eczema cream. So we have everything pretty much covered. Uh, and we do give a 30-day money-back guarantee, no questions asked. If people want to order your product, how do they get a hold of you? They can find us at uh, Scotty's Creams. That's S-C-O-T-T-Y-S, C-R-E-A-M-S, dot com. Excellent. Well, have a good show, and thank you very much. Hi, I'm Michael Smith. I'm with Colleen, my... Uh, teammate with uh, Shop Talk, and we first started doing the show, we talked about doing locations, and lo and behold, here's Colleen on location. And um, I've had a hard time talking to her because she's got so many friends here in this location. And what is the exact name of, her, of this event? It's called the Festival of Earthly Treasures. Excellent. I keep on calling it the Goddess Shop. but Oh, well, the Goddess Shop is putting it on, and she's raising money and awareness for the Esperanza Foundation. That's fantastic. Well, I absolutely uh, love your booth. It's absolutely pretty. Who's your teammate here? Pretty colorful. This is Rosie. Hi. And Rosie makes these wonderful earrings. Oh, wow. She's got skills, huh? I'd like to talk about a couple of them. She 
Okay. Yeah. Now these are from Nepal. Need to this talk up a little bit? Amber from Nepal. Excellent. I special order them. This is one of my favorite stones. This is African turquoise. And then this is lapis, which is hard to find this particular shape. Yeah, these are my special ones. And then I have my bears and my animals. She makes little bears, little horses. These are like laurel birches cats. Kitty cats. Those are made in the U.S. Excellent. And I try to use colorful stones because laurel birch always uses colors in her. Well, they're very nice. Yeah. And then we have the bears. I love the bears. The bears are awesome. We have bears and horses. These, these horses are with kyanite. Those are, the horses are made in the U.S. And she has owls. Every time I get to her, she moves. She moves. What? Every time I get to you, you move. It takes me five seconds to get to it, and it's like gone. It's like a, she's like a magician. This is a big booth. You had a lot of people help you, I hope. Excellent. Oh, that's beautiful. It's a nice presentation too. Thank you. So you'll tell the quality, the type of stones are, are on the background. And do you have those at your store too, Colleen? I do. Excellent. And Jesse is here with us today also. Jesse does some really cute earrings also and necklaces. She's got butterflies, owls, turtles. Well, it sounds like you're uh, bringing out the jewelry today. Is that the hers? These are the um, jowl earrings, matching necklace. Oh, they're very nice. Excellent. You brought some uh, some skilled labor here, I think. Yes, we did. And all these uh, clothes items. There's a lot of a lot of types yeah. here too. A lot of clothing tops are very popular, and they're easy to set in the tent. We also have dresses. Oh, my wife would have loved these hats. And I have to show you my hippie. Okay. I was I was trying to get a pair for myself. Aren't those great? <laughs> I love them. They're beautiful. Um, with the pink shoes, gotta love it. I, I think your uh, fashion sense is awesome. Well, I hope. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about this festival? Well, there's just all kinds of things going on. There's Hanem um, painting, um, handmade gifts, essential oils, salt lamps. Well, we're having a, we're having a lot of fun meeting a lot of different people. So, are you going to be here in six months? Because uh, Liz says it's going to be a six month event. We're going to do it again. Excellent. Well, we're looking forward to uh, spending more time with your other artists. And uh, thank you for talking to us. Bye bye. Buddy, Sandy, Lene, we're at the uh, <laughs> the festival. <laughs> At the Festival of Earthly Treasures, yes! Excellent! I'm Sandy Lene from Psychic Creations, and I'm here today with my actual business, which is Sandy Psychic Stones. I give intuitive readings using all these wonderful stones. They're beautiful! Thank I you! I have worked with these for 30 years. Actually, in August, it'll be 30 years I have been given intuitive readings with this. Excellent! They're absolutely, I took a picture because they're so pretty. They are, I love them, they're my best friends. And, and who's your uh, friend here? This is part of my package. This is Becky. And she is here helping me out today because I've got one of my books, Sandy Psychic Stones, that I have for sale. I remember that. And That's I one book I don't have. You don't have one? No. Well, you need one. I just gave my, my beautiful sister the day house in the parking lot. Oh. Yeah, because I mean, uh, cause she gave me back the Genoa book, I guess, the Genoa bar. Oh, fun. Yeah. Well, by the enjoy that book, too. Then I have some other things. I create and sell. These are you, real good you, you make these stores. things? I do. I program each kit. They're stone energy kits or I have divination kits too. Awesome. And I program each stone that goes into the kit. Uh, they're very good sellers on my store. Well, thank you for being on Shop Talk. Thank you. It's been Michael Smith reporting from Carson City. Thank you. Thank you.